Right, this is the fourth and final part of this series where I've built a hi-fi from components that I found on eBay. Now, initially, when I set out to do this, I was thinking I was going to build it as cheaply as possible. But there's a certain point you don't want to dip below because you start getting into real rubbish stuff. So this is the cheapest that I was prepared to go to buy the things that I thought would be of a reasonable quality. And I've added it all up and it's come to about £200 so far. So it's not entirely cheap when it comes down to it. Uh, but the next component I got, well, actually is the first component, the compact disc player. I started out with this, I was actually looking for something else on eBay and realised I needed a, a small compact display with an optical output to use in another video. So I just bought one, it seemed alright, £34.75. And then once I got that I thought, well that wasn't a bad price, I wonder how cheaply I could put together a, a compact size hi-fi system and that's the thing that set this whole video off. So really the CD player came first, even though you're going to see the final thing in this video. Reason being, it doesn't quite match the other components, uh, but I wasn't thinking about that when I bought it. And that tells you a little bit about how when you buy a component that doesn't match the other ones, it does seem to stick out a little bit. So you want to kind of try and keep a, a theme, a look to things, because at the moment this looks pretty smart. Well, let's see what happens when I add the CD player onto it. The system we've constructed so far has been all analogue with the record player, the cassette and the radio, so adding in a compact disc player is the first digital component that's going into here. Not many people have anything good to say about CDs anymore, but they are still often the cheapest way to buy a new physical copy of an album. And of course, there's a lot of cheap secondhand CDs available as well. The model I've got here, DCD F100 from Denon, would have been part of a mini system, I believe, at some point, but I've just bought it separately. Looking at the top of it, we can see that it's got a sticker on here. This indicates that it has been subject to portable appliance testing. And the appearance of that sticker on this machine indicates to me that at some point it probably made its way through a second-hand store where I believe they have to test items before they can put them on sale, which is why quite a lot of charity shops in the UK don't want to get involved in second-hand electronics. Now, whilst I'm sure manufacturers at the time were keen to point out the vast difference between their compact disc player and that of another manufacturer, to me they all seem pretty much the same. They just play compact discs. This one's got line output on the left. We've got two connectors to connect up to the other items that mini system and it's got an optical digital output which is why I chose this particular machine over the other ones I could see for sale at the time. With that optical digital output you could connect this up to an external DAC, a digital to analog converter which potentially would be better than the built-in one inside the machine and make those compact discs sound even better. Whether or not I'd be able to tell the difference I doubt it very much. Now this particular device cost me £34.75 including postage. Of course the postage is almost the same as the price of the compact display which shows that if you do have a decent second-hand shop in your area you could probably save a lot of money by picking these things up in person. The only other item of note on the back of this component is this power outlet on the right. It says it's unswitched, which means it's on all the time, as long as the first device, of course, is plugged in. Now, the idea behind these is it enables you to daisy chain a number of different components together whilst just using the one plug plugged into the wall on the first device. In my hi-fi, this comes in very handy because I've got a number of Japanese components in here that just run off 100 volts. So with those, I've got them all daisy chained together, and on the first device, that's running off a step-down power transformer. It means I don't have to use multiple step-down power transformers, one for each device. I've noticed I can't switch this machine off. The on-off button on the front just turns it into on or off, which is really standby because it still says off on the screen, so it's still using power up. It doesn't have CD text or anything like that. You better tell if it did. The logo would generally say so, but I'm not really too fussed about that. Of course, there's no remote control on this either. That would have been part of the whole mini system. This one, I have to use the buttons on the front. I quite like the way the track numbers are displayed along the bottom there, though. Each time you go to the next track, you'll see the number of remaining tracks are disappearing along the bottom there, so just a nice little feature, but 
again, nothing too elaborate. It's just a compact disc player. At least I think it is. I mean, it's making all the right moves as to whether or not it will produce any sound, though. We'll only find out in a moment. It really does look out of place there, though. This shows the importance of picking components that match each other. But we'll plug it in. I'm going to use less cable than that. You're better using a shorter RCA cable as you can get between two different components just to cut down on the cable clutter at the back. And this device, of course, is just going to plug from the line output into the auxiliary input on the amplifier. Uh, just a matter of popping that CD back in, switching the amplifier into auxiliary, and uh, we'll just have a quick listen. Now initially I thought there might be something wrong with the CD player's output, perhaps it was too loud because it looked like the peak level meters weren't moving at all on my amplifier. It turns out this particular CD has been subject to a brick walling of the levels so that it outputs its maximum volume. You can see when I change tracks some of them will move those indicators up and down but once the track gets going they just stick there at the top. But as far as playing back a CD goes, this CD player will play a CD like a CD player should play a CD. Sounds like a CD playing on a CD player. So let's go back to that record player because I wanted to play you a direct feed from the vinyl. So what I'm doing this time, I'm putting the output from the headphones into my PCM recorder and you can just have a listen back to that for a moment. After listening to that, I thought I should try recording it onto a brand new chrome tape. Well, new old stock TDK SA90. And I'm also going to record it with the Dolby noise reduction switched on. So we're testing out all the functions here, really. So now I'll play you back the results of that recording. OK, well, I think it's time for me to summarise what I think about the four components I've assembled over the course of this four episode budget hi-fi build. So starting with those speakers, for me, these are the star of the show. They're the most expensive component I bought, but you also get what you pay for. And in this case, you get quite a bit more than that when you consider what they originally cost. Now, moving on to that Casiva, an unusual choice to make, but for me, that's what makes it fun. Getting three devices in one is normally a big compromise, but this early 80s component still has some of that 1970s build quality. It's a device that was made before all-in-one hi-fi components became the mass-market plasticky hi-fi system synonymous with the 1980s. With the addition of RCA switch boxes, all the components in my proper hi-fi could be attached up to this amp with its record output and the auxiliary input, you aren't restricted to using the built-in tape recorder. There's even an option to introduce components into the audio chain, for example, a graphic equaliser or my DBX disc decoder. Now, the turntable, while it looks good and it performs its job, it does feel a heck of a lot cheaper than it looks. It just doesn't feel like a quality deck. It feels like a budget model, which is effectively exactly what it was in the Pioneer lineup back in the day. Now my first upgrade to this system though would be to replace it with a neat linear tracking turntable, the Technics SL5, which would fit on top of that Casiva and reduce the overall size of everything. Now the CD player, well I bought this without thinking of the rest of the system, so it doesn't visually match the other components. That said, it's working fine, so if this was my only hi-fi system and I was on a budget, I'd be reluctant to rushing into spending any more money to replace it just because I didn't like the colour, but it's more than likely if I waited a while I'd be able to find someone disposing of a suitably coloured CD player for next to nothing or perhaps nothing. Overall, I've got to say that whilst I did okay with my build, I know you can do a heck of a lot better than this for much less money. You just need to have plenty of patience and be prepared to shop around. Right, so that's it. That's the end of the four-part series on building a budget hi-fi. Now, would I buy any of these things again? Well, 
Probably not, and not because anything is wrong with them, it's just I like to experience new things. So you'll get these people that go on the same holiday every year to the same place. I don't do that, I want to go somewhere different every year. Same with my hi-fi. If I was going on eBay today buying some new hi-fi components, making a similar system, they'd probably be completely different, and that's the fun of it. What I would say is if you are buying a hi-fi and you're starting out, don't worry too much about what's the best. Get the things that talk to you, the things that when you see them, you think, oh that's brilliant I'd really love one of those and if you can afford it then start with that but of course remember that whatever you get as far as your first component it's probably going to lead on and the other components are going to have to follow a similar pattern for example if I was to get everything in a gold or well, champagne finish then as we saw before, if you start mixing matching colours together, you start thinking, well, that doesn't really go with that, and you end up having to sort of swap things out again. So yeah, you just be conscious to start with what direction you want to head in, what look you want for your hi-fi, because yeah, I know it's all about the sound, but it isn't, it's about how the thing looks as well. And also expansion. Uh, everything I bought had expansion capabilities, well, I suppose apart from the speakers, but those were good in their own right. But yeah, the amplifier, there was lots of ins and outs on the back of that. I could have added additional components to that. Even the CD player, you could have put an external DAC on that. So you can see how you could start off with some of these things. You can sort of build on them. But say with the speakers, you could have kept those speakers, great speakers, and then swapped other things out throughout uh, one at a time. So it's not about the race of getting to the ultimate hi-fi right at the beginning. It's all about the experience of building it, the enjoyment of putting a hi-fi together, as far as I'm concerned. But I've managed to get all these videos out just before Christmas, battling through illness. You can tell my voice is different now, so I'm just about getting back to normal. So all I can really say is thanks for watching, for all the previous videos you might have seen during the last year as well, and uh, have a Merry Christmas, and that's it for the moment. I don't know what to say. I normally say that's it for the moment, and always... Anyway, yeah, um, thanks. Now, while the credits are rolling, I just want to add on a little bit here, uh, a, a tale, a story, with it being Christmas time, people sort of have stories and things. This one dates back to the 1990s when I was working in an office, and there was a chap there, and uh, I was speaking to him about something, and he told me that he was going to go looking around old bookshops at the weekend. And I was asking him what kind of things he was looking for, and apparently he collected these, uh, I think it was Observer's Book of Automobiles. They were like little pocket books. They were issued between, I think, 1955 and 1980, or something like that. So a new one every year. And he was trying to collect the whole set. And he was missing a, a number of them. There were certain years that were quite difficult to find in this. Uh, and uh, this was his hobby. What he did is he got in his car at the weekend, drove to a town he hadn't been to before, went looking around the old bookshops trying to find these uh, books. But of course, in the uh, process of that, he got to see different parts of the country. It was a whole experience for him. It wasn't just about getting the books. Um, but anyway, he told me about this. I said, oh, uh, this is around about 96, 97, perhaps. I, he said, uh, I said, well, have you ever looked at eBay for those ones you're missing? And he went, uh, eBay? What's, what's eBay? And of course, it was all new back then. So I took him over to my computer. And uh, in, at the time in the office, you could get on the internet without any problem. There was nothing uh, that was blocked. So showed him eBay, showed him. I said, oh, what, what one are you looking for, for example? He said, oh, 1957 or something. You know, looked it up. He, he always wanted the ones with the slip case on, you know, pristine condition. So they looked all nice on the shelf found it, a really good condition one, I, of course I got an account, I ordered it, and a few days later it turned up at the office, uh, I gave it to him, he said, oh that's brilliant, that's, I've been looking for that for years, and I didn't think anything more of it. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, uh, he said, uh, I said, how are you getting on with those uh, with those books, said, have you seen any more, that you've, you know, for, for the ones you're missing, he says, oh yeah, I've got them all now, uh, after you showed me eBay, I signed up to it, I found them all on there, and I, I've got the whole set now, and he was kind of a bit disappointed because the problem was that was it. That was that had killed his hobby. I, without realising it, I'd uh, given him the shortcut to the solution to his hobby, so he no longer had a reason to drive to these other parts of the country and, and visit nice places and maybe have a pub lunch out, stay over at somewhere. Uh, just uh, the whole experience. It, it really wasn't about the books. The books were an excuse to do another thing, and the reason I'm telling you this tale is because. 
The solution, the end result, the finish line, often isn't the enjoyable thing. It's the race, the experience, the whole part of it that comes before. So just like me putting a hi-fi together, it's not about getting the ultimate best hi-fi immediately tick, just you know, ring someone up, hello, can I have the best hi-fi? Here it is, it turns up. No, it's about putting it together, about the enjoyment of uh, getting the different components, reading up on things, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, don't get too hung up on the finish line, just enjoy the race or the experience before then. And that's the other thing I've got to say, that's a little bit of a Christmas message for you, just enjoy the moment. Don't worry about trying to get to the end of it because the end isn't as interesting as the current. Anyway, that is it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.